lep pozdrav vsem, hvala, da ste prišli. Za zavolj enostavnosti bom pri tem vodu kar preskočil v angliščino. Welcome everyone. I have honor to introduce here tonight Professor Sebastian Redl. Sebastian Redl is a professor for practical philosophy at the University of Leipzig. He's the author of a number of books, Kategorien des Zeitlichen, Self-Consciousness, and most recently, Self-Consciousness and Objectivity, Introduction to Absolute Idealism. One of them, Self-Consciousness, is also translated in Slovenian, Samo Zavedanje, published by Zeložba Kartina, translated by myself. As you might have already gathered from the announcement for this lecture, or if not, you surely will be able to notice during the lecture, Professor Rill uh, takes a rather distinctive approach in philosophy, uh, a manner of doing philosophy that is notably different from what we are generally used to around here. Uh, it could be described as uh, introduction of themes of German idealism into the framework of analytic philosophy. Apropos, he's also a member of research institution, uh, Forschungskolleg, uh, analytical German idealism in Leipzig. Um, in particular, um, he, sets, uh, he sets out in his work uh, from analysis of first-person thought of what it means to, to, to think, to speak in first person, and then he proceeds to develop quite far-reaching philosophical consequences from that. Um, well, tonight he's going to present what this approach means, specifically uh, concerning the topics of evil and its forgiveness. Professor Riddle, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It is a great honor and a great pleasure to be speaking here. I learned that Reformation Day is a state holiday uh, here, and this emboldened me to present my most Lutheran talk. Um, Understanding what something is, is understanding its principle. Understanding what human action is, is understanding its principle. Therefore, there is no action theory distinct from ethics. For the principle of human action is the thought of good and evil, and thus is good and evil. In this, in its principle, lies the infinite difference of human action from animal movement. Perhaps this is not evident when we confine ourselves to things done like baking a cake. And not because human action is something other than baking cakes and the like, but because it is not possible to understand what it is to bake a cake without its wider context, as Michael Thompson puts it. This wider context is thought in thought of the good. And the wider context of human action is infinitely different from that of animal action. For it is not just wider, it is the widest. The context of human action is illimitable. The character, this character of the principle of human action affects its temporality. As its principle is illimitable, so is its temporality. Human action is temporal in such a way as to be all time and eternity. This comes out in the way in which my action is not over. When it's over, I repent, I'm punished. My past is my present, which thus is eternity or hell. And it comes out in the way in which my action may be undone. I confess, I am forgiven. My past is annulled. It is perfectly powerless in my present, which thus is 
eternity or heaven. Thinking something, being conscious of grounds that justify thinking it, is called inferring. We can distinguish inferring that concludes in thinking that such and such is the case from inferring that concludes in thinking that such and such is good to do. We can mark this distinction by calling the former theoretical inference in its conclusion a judgment and the latter a practical inference and its conclusion a practical thought. A thought in which practical reasoning concludes, a practical thought, understands itself to be valid. It is the thought of its own validity. The concept of its validity thus is internal to every practical thought. In the deployment of this concept, a practical thought is constituted as such. And therefore, this concept, the concept of practical thought's validity that practical thought itself employs, this concept is illimitable within practical thought. As a practical thought thinks what it does, through this concept, no practical thought limits that concept by another concept on the same plane. The concept of the validity of practical thought is not a content of practical thought next to other contents. Now, practical thought, I said, thinks it good to do such and such. Now, therein it thinks the validity or justice of doing such and such. And the justice of doing something, the rightness, the validity, is none other than the justice of thinking it good to do. Hence, the concept of acting well, thought in practical thought, it's being a thought to the effect that it is good to do such and such. So the concept of acting well, that is thought in practical thought, is not a content next to other contents. In the deployment of this concept, practical thought is constituted as such. And therefore, this concept is not in practical thought limited by another concept on the same plane. The concept of acting well is illimitable within practical thought. It may be called the universal concept as opposed to specific general concepts which are distinguished from each other by their content. Now, my main theme in this lecture will be the character of universality that has opened up in practical thought's idea of its own validity, that being the same as the idea of the goodness of acting that is thought in practical thought, the peculiar character of that concept, uh, its universality. It's having no other next to it by which it would be limited. That, that's my theme. Um, so I, uh, as I also express this, I say this idea of goodness is the universal. Hegelian way of speaking. Um, as the idea of goodness is the universal, what is thought in thought of acting well is the whole. Not a whole, but the whole. The goodness thought in practical thought is absolute. In practical reasoning, and I understand the good to be the principle of my action, and this understanding of my action, which is nothing other than my action, knows itself to be grounded in the absolute. This is why there is no action theory. Sorry, you may also may all not be interested in action theory then. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing, um, what is it, coal to Newcastle. Um, I apologize. 
no action theory. Perhaps there is a theory of animal movement. Sorry, action theory, no, action theory is a alleged philosophical discipline which, whose topic is um, human action under, an, uh, under uh, the supposition that uh, it can be thematized without introducing the idea of unconditional goodness. That is that field. Mm, I say there's no such field. Um, <clears throat> perhaps there can be an, a theory of animal movement. That is itself is doubtful. Um, I doubt that the animal is actually an object of a theory. But uh, even if there is human action is no animal movement, its principle is infinitely different. Comprehension of human action surely is no theory at all. Um, I'm doing this here now, understanding it to be good to do. That's the foundational, the elementary act of practical thought. I'm doing this here now, understanding it good to do. Therein I understand it's being good to explain why I am doing it. Its goodness is the measure of perfection and the source of actuality of that which is good. It explains why and how it is, that, how that is, why and how that is which is good. And this I understand in acting, knowing what I'm doing and why, seeing that and why it is good to do. The good is my principle. I, he mentioned that I, my, the way in which I try to think about um, themes that are customarily classified as philosophical is um, by seeing them to be understood from within themselves. So um, the understanding of human action I seek to, pro to propound and to expound is one that I um, want to understand as being an understanding that is internal to human action. And that is essentially the understanding of my action that is expressed in the first person. This doesn't mean, as we shall see, that is in any way particular to me as we're in distinction to, say, you and you, yet the understanding is essentially expressed in the first person. The good is my principle, I say, therefore. Now, the goodness thought, in practical thought, I said, is no limited content. It is universal. Action goodness is not a goodness. It is goodness, period. Goodness, sans phrase, goodness itself. In acting from knowledge of the good, and that is from the good, I understand the good, absolute goodness, to be the principle of what is happening as I'm acting. I so understand it, in understanding it to be my principle. As I understand myself to do this here now, seeing it to be good to do, I know my principle to be the whole. Therein, I know my principle to be the highest. It is highest as it cannot be placed next to something other on the same plane and cannot be contained in something larger than it. It cannot be thought from outside itself. The principle of human action is the highest because human action is from thought and thought is the thought of its own principle, which principle therefore is illimitable or the whole. So in this self-understanding of practical thought there is as well an opening up, as it were, into a universality, into the whole. And that thought of the whole is therein the thought of my principle. So I myself, as it were, am opened up in this way. What I am, as it were, explodes. <clears throat> so then I spoke rather lyrically about my principle, the highest, the highest principle. Only the highest can be my principle, first person principle. Um, now, what would that be, that highest principle? Um, it may seem that the highest, that this principle of mine provides um, um, a certain description of a way of acting description of, that specifies a certain way of acting as one of acting well. 
So to act is to act well, that may say. And then it may seem that knowledge that this here is good to do is knowledge that a certain way of acting, um, or that, that doing this here now conforms to the description that is provided by the principle according to which I thus act. However, knowledge of the good, knowledge that puts into action the idea of how to act well is not knowledge that this here now conforms to a description provided by that idea. For from such knowledge, knowledge that a certain way of acting, that doing this here now conforms to a certain description, such knowledge, from such knowledge it could never follow that, is, that it is good to do this here now. For example, it may be, and I suppose it's right, that it's good to, to comfort one's friend. It's a general idea of how to act is to act well. Comfort your friend. However, from the fact that it is good to comfort my friend and that doing this here now is comforting my friend, it does not follow that it is good to do this here now. For it is possible that doing this here now, I am comforting my friend all right while acting badly in doing what I'm doing. I may be comforting him by displaying and arousing in him hatred of a third person. The knowledge that doing this here now conforms to a description, comforting my friend as in our example, never suffices to exclude that there is something on account of which it is bad to do this here now. This could be excluded only if the content of the good could be exhausted by a given description. And this is the denial that the good is universal and thus is the destruction of its very idea, the idea of knowledge of the good. Its limitation to a given set of descriptions, general descriptions of how to act, is a destruction of the idea of the good because it's a denial of its universality. It is true that knowledge that puts the idea of the good into practice is properly expressed in a statement to the effect, for example, that doing this here now is comforting my friend. I may therewith express my understanding of doing what I'm doing as good to do. So here I'm comforting my friend, that's why. And yet, insofar as this shows that it is good to do this here now, the knowledge so expressed is knowledge that there is nothing, neither in general nor in the circumstances by which it is bad to do this here now. And in this way, the knowledge from which she acts who acts well is illimitable. For there is no limit to what could render it bad to do something even while it conforms to a given description. That's the other side of the inexhaustibility of the idea of the good by a given set of description. You cannot provide, as were, a list of conditions by satisfying which it would be secure that doing what you do, as it satisfies those description, is not bad. So no limit to the ways in which it may be bad to do something even while it conforms to a given description. And so knowledge that it is good to do this because therein I'm comforting my friend, this is illimitable knowledge. In fact, illimitable knowledge uh, which underlies any general idea of how to act and any reasoning from it to a thought that it is good to do this here now. And it is in this illimitable knowledge that thought of the good is determinate on this thought of this here now. Um, the idea that acting well can't be understood as conforming one's comportment to a description or a set of descriptions. Um, this idea um, is also um, expressed in the venerable rejection, um, sorry, in the venerable distinction of the letter and the spirit. 
The law, or a law, states in general terms how one must act in order to agree with the letter of the law. Um, it suffices to act in order to agree with the latter, to act in such a way as to satisfy the description given by the law. And this requires mere theoretical knowledge and no um, knowledge of the good at all, to know that what one is doing conforms to the letter. No goodness required here, just subsumption of particular under general concepts, theoretical knowledge. In order to act, by contrast, according to the spirit of the law, it is necessary to understand, in doing what one is doing, that the law demands the good. Someone's acting according to the spirit, therefore, exhibits the illimitable knowledge by which he knows that it is good to do this here now, and no such knowledge is exhibited by her insofar as she just conforms to the letter. So knowledge that my action conforms to the letter is not illimitable, it is perfectly limited. It's the limited knowledge that what I'm doing conforms to the description provided by the law. Knowledge that therein I'm acting well is acting according to the spirit and the, and the knowledge thus put into action is illimitable. Now, um, I already introduced the idea of the law. <clears throat> now we'll further now enter this idea. Uh, understanding that it is good to do this here now, I may understand that I must do it, and that it is necessary to do it. I understand that it would be bad not to do it. Or I understand that it is necessary not to do this, or that it would be bad to do this. Now, the good, insofar as it is thought of in this way, is the law. That is, the law is the good as it forbids, namely what is bad. This is the dark side of the good, <laughs> the law. Uh, the law is, is the good in this capacity, and the law in this capacity is as illimitable as the good, it's, as it were. It's, 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 it's the good considered in its capacity to forbid, um, in its capacity to exclude acting badly. So, um, as the law is the good insofar as it forbids what is bad, I know the good to be the law as I understand the idea of acting badly. Now, let's consider that idea. The illimitability of the goodness of action is reflected in the manner of badness that belongs to action, or that is, as we're proper to action. That badness has a quite peculiar character in virtue of being the badness that belongs to the goodness that is illimitable, that is the goodness of, that is thought, in practical thought, in thought of the good. We see this when we contrast the goodness of action with a natural goodness. And I here mean to be using the term that provides the title of Philippa Foote's uh, admirable book of that title, Natural Goodness. Um, and uh, thus be discussing an idea that she herself, Foote, and Michael Thompson have put forward under the idea that a natural goodness, the goodness through which we think, um, which has its proper uh, home in thought of the living, uh, is also uh, um, or the logical character of the thought of good that defines ethics. And I mean to reject that idea. So I'm going to say a bit what natural goodness is, I think it will be very easy to grasp. An animal may, on a given occasion, fail to act in conformity with its life form. And therein, we may, if we may speak in this way, it acts badly or not as it should, or its, its action is naturally bad, as we're deviating from its nature, we might say. Um, the natural badness of its comportment on this occasion leaves its life form or natural goodness intact as the principle of its activity. Indeed, that very principle which explains an animal's naturally good actions equally explains its naturally bad actions, the latter, as Aristotle puts it, by negation and subtraction. 
the naturally bad action falls to circumstances that impeded the proper operation of the life form in the given situation. These circumstances and their causality can only be comprehended in terms of the life form as what has deflected or deformed or diminished its expression. Thus, a he cat may mount what is not a she cat, being led astray by appearances. That's an operation of its life form. I mean, it's, def it's defective in a, in a way, it's a, as we say when she's misled. You know, but, but it's still an operation of its life form that is as we're deflected from its proper, what, it's, what is its proper exercise by unfavorable circumstances. Uh, a fox may eat a bad fish. Uh, the explanation of this is the same as is eating a good fish, it's just that circumstances have come in the way uh, and thus, um, are, uh, and these circumstances account for the, as well, Defectiveness or badness of um, what the fox what the fox is doing, which sort of, um, um, yeah. um, now um, thus as I just explained in these actions, uh, the respective life forms, the natural goodness is at work. It is just that in the situation, its activity is botched on account of unfavorable circumstances. Now this is the idea. Speak slowly here. It's important. The idea of the bad as privation, steresis, you know, venerable Aristotelian concept, the bad as there is privation, um, that is, um, privation is a lack that is to be put to forces extraneous to the good circumstances. Within this conception, within the conception of natural goodness, there is no such thing as badness of the principle. There is no logical space for that. Indeed, principle and goodness are the same. This is the proper way to think of natural goodness. Natural goodness is nothing other than principle, and badness is privation. There's a lack to be put not to the principle, but rather to circumstances inhibiting the proper operation of the principle. Now, if, good, if the goodness I think in practical thought were a natural goodness, then this would be the way for me to think about myself, knowing that I have acted badly. As I acted badly, my principle, my natural goodness was at work, but it was thwarted in its exercise by unfavorable conditions. Badness attaches to my behavior in that situation, but this does not impugn my principle. My action is not explained by my principle insofar as my action is bad. Its badness falls to forces external to that principle that have deflected its operation from its proper course. While I may have acted badly, this does nothing to show. Indeed, it is incapable of showing that I am bad. It cannot show this, for nothing can show what makes no sense, and there is no meaning to the idea of a corrupt principle, so it would be if the goodness of my action were a natural goodness. But it is not that for, and I know that it is not that because I can make sense of the idea, not only that I have acted badly, I can make something of the idea that I am bad. And there would be no such idea if the goodness I thought in practical thought were natural goodness. As I am able to make something of the idea that I am bad, I know that the goodness that I think in practical thought is no natural goodness. The badness of human action is no privation. Many languages have a distinct word for this badness, the badness that is no privation. In English, that word is evil. The good thought in practical thought stands opposed to evil, a natural goodness does not oppose evil. There's no space for evil within the sphere of natural goodness. An animal can deviate from its natural goodness in its actions, but there's no such thing as an animal turning against its principle for it has no act, no activity on the level of the principle 
Thought, however, is its own principle and thus possesses as act the generality of a principle. As the goodness of human action is thought, a human being being active according to its principle is active according to it in thought, which is the principle from which she acts. And hence, she can oppose the good in thought. And thus, in her principle, she can raise principle against principle. This does not mean that her principle is something other than the good. The, we saw that this makes no sense, for the goodness of human action is illimitable. There's nothing other than it. There's nothing as well on the same plane as it. It is the whole. A principle that opposes the good, therefore, is, has no other content. We saw the good has no limitable content next to which another content could be placed. So, opposition to the good is rejection of the good. Evil is the badness that is not lack, but rejection. The badness thus is not contrary to goodness. It's not a contrary of goodness. It's contradictory. It's a, a sharpening or deepening in the idea of the good that is proper to human thought and human action in comparison to the idea of badness that is proper to the animal. There we have privation. Privation is a form of contrary, indeed the first form, according to Aristotle, of contrariety. Badness in human, um, of human action is contradictory. Privilege of human, <laughs> of human badness. Uh, <clears throat> not only can there be badness in the principle, so in the animal, there's no badness in the principle ever. Principle and goodness are the same. That's natural goodness. For the animal has no act that is itself universal. That is only thought, and thus only thought can raise principle against principle. So there is badness in the principle. Not only that, in fact, badness can only be in the principle. Not only can we say badness of her who acts as opposed to merely of her action, uh, we do and must say that she who acts badly is bad. A naturally bad action of an animal is, ex is explained by the same principle that explains its naturally good actions by negation and subtraction. There is no such thing as a badness of its principle, for the animal has no act that is principle. The animal has no general act. In our case, by contrast, what is bad may be an act that is the principle. Um, now, this doesn't mean that in some cases badness of action is to be explained according to the natural goodness model that is to be put down to circumstances while in other exceptionally bad, uh, bad cases it's to be put down to badness of the principle no um, on the it, in fact um, in all cases badness of action in the human case must be put down to the corruption of the principle uh, and this is because there is no meaning to the idea of circumstances unfavorable to the goodness thought in practical thought. It's not just that um, the badness of human action has, as were, well, a possibility, a further possibility, not just lack but rejection. Rather, the idea of, of badness as lack makes no sense in the case of um, human action. Uh, and this is because the goodness of human action is universal. Uh, and this is registered in the knowledge that puts into practice the idea of the good. It is knowledge that there is nothing, as I said, on account of which it is bad to do what thus one knows is good. As that knowledge is illimitable, in this way, it is this knowledge of the good has no circumstances that are external to it. The idea of forces extraneous to it that compromise its expression makes no sense, hence there's only one expression, no, only one explanation of someone's having acted badly. He's evil. That I have acted badly proves I'm evil, and thus my action is evil. It is not that my good principle has been hindered to operate properly. Rather, my principle is not good at all. I have rejected the good. What I here say about myself, Kant says about humanity. He asserts that humanity, that humanity is afflicted by an original propensity for evil. 
his basis for saying that is the same as that on which I know myself to be evil. The propensity to evil, according to Kant, is an act of freedom, a free rejection of the good. And this act, Kant says, is original to humanity. It is humanity itself. Humanity, Kant says, is this act of rejecting the good originally. I'm, now, I'm not interested in Kant's doctrine here of the original propensity to evil, but it's helpful in the present con context to see on what ground Kant asserts that there is original to humanity a propensity to evil. How does, how does Kant know this? It seems rather pessimistic for you to take of ourselves. Perhaps he's too pessimistic. Perhaps we should be more optimistic. It's not so bad, Emmanuel. Now, he appears in the text, it's in the, in the religion within the bounds of pure reason. Uh, he appears to give us grounds, <clears throat> examples of human beings acting badly. Uh, he describes cases of human beings acting badly. And one may ask why any number of such examples, he, he seems only to give examples, why does any number of such examples prove a claim of such sweeping generality, a claim about humanity and its original propensity. How, how could any number of examples yield that conclusion? Now Kant says, in fact, a single case would suffice. He gives many cases, but in fact he explains one case would suffice. I don't even need two. I'm just giving you more than one, but this is not important, he explains. A single case suffices. Um, for why th this is the important point, and this is, the, this is the same point I was trying to bring out, in, in, in that um, there's no explanation of an act, a bad action other than the evil of uh, its principle. When someone acts well in doing this here now, then it's being good to do explains why she's doing it. It explains it directly without intermediaries not internal to its being good to do. And in acting, I understand this. And this is, means I do not allow anything outside the principle from which I act to explain why I act as I do. This is uh, my dignity. Uh, I do not consider the principle from which I act to be such as to depend in order for me to act well on circumstances not known to me in acting as I do. I do not think it a haphazard thing whether I act well or not. Um, I, if I did, I would therein evince an understanding of myself and my action that disallowed thinking it through the idea of the good. And this means, conversely, that I cannot put down my acting badly to something other than myself, to something other than my principle. Thus, I can know my principle from my action with absolute certainty, nor can anyone have any grounds to exclude herself from this conclusion, for this would require that she knows that she has never acted and will never act badly, and no one can know this. For let us consider how one would know this. Disconcerted by the knowledge that I acted badly, I may try to convince myself that this was an exception. While I have acted badly here and now, still I am good. Or perhaps I want to convince myself that while I was bad, now I am good, or anyway better than I was. In order to convince myself of this, I seek to know that in a given case, I acted well. I want to find some confirmation of this comforting thought for when he says, I'm anyway better than I was. So I, so I want to know in a given case that I acted well and not badly, that I did not trespass against the law. As I try to know this, I recognize or that I do not know this and cannot know this. And this again convinces me that I am bad. For if I did act well, I would know that I acted well. So this is a predicament so that I'm trying to bring out a bit further now that the attempt to convince myself, as were to 
to, to find conviction, to find certainty that I acted well, that this movement, as it were, is precisely the one in which I cannot but acquire absolute certainty that I act badly and that I am bad. Right? So, we're beginning to enter the field of dialectic this way. <laughs> Seeing that it's good to do this here now on the ground that, say, X, uh, it's confident my friend, uh, I, know that that ground, um, I know that ground to show the goodness of doing what thereby I'm doing. And this means that I know that there is nothing in virtue of which it is bad to do this here now. I may be able to establish that X holds, that is, I may be able to establish that um, um, I indeed comfort my friend, I am indeed comforting my friend. But this only establishes that doing this here now satisfies a certain description. It only establishes that my action conforms to the letter of the law. In order to know that doing this here now is good, it does not suffice to know that it satisfies a given description. I must know that nothing shows it to be bad to do this here now. And the source of this knowledge, the knowledge that doing this here now is conforming to the spirit, of the law is the good. However, it is a question, is a question raised by my knowledge that I have acted badly, whether I am good. I do not know that I'm good. I'm trying to establish this, or I'm trying anyway to establish that I'm better than I was. Um, I want to know that I am good, and therefore I do not know that I possess that illimitable knowledge that I need to act well, knowledge whose source is the good. My perception may be corrupted. My idea that I see that it is good to do this here now may reflect my having rejected the good. Far from constituting my knowledge of the good, it may be proof of my evil principle. Indeed, that it is, is confirmed over and over again. I know that I have acted badly and tried to convince myself that yet I am not bad. It is impossible that I convince myself of this. It follows that I cannot know that I have never and will never act badly. It follows that I know in Kant's terms that I have turned against the good. I am an, origi an original act of evil. Um, the law, that is the good, insofar as I trespass against it, may be articulated in general statements, saying in general how to act is to act well. Uh, above, we discuss the notion that in order to act well, it is sufficient to act in a way that conforms to the general description given in such a statement. If this were so, acting well would be no more difficult in principle than conforming myself to the rules of a country club Living in favorable circumstances and being blessed with a favorable disposition, one could be certain to be in line with a requirement. But the good, and therefore the law, cannot be captured by any set of general statements. The good thought and practical thought is illimitable. Therefore, in order to follow it, one must be able to see that nothing renders it bad to do this here now, and this ability can be represented as purity of heart. It is not the empty purity of heart in the abstract thought of doing one's duty for the sake of duty, Kant's idea of a pure heart. It is uh, the purity of the heart that sees everything, the purity of heart of her whose vision is not occluded by, uh, whose vision is occluded by nothing that would separate her for, from, from the good. Right, so uh, no, no rules of a country club, but the idea of that form of perfectly unoccluded vision is uh, um, which signifies um, goodness. Um, again, a reflection of the illimit illimitability of, of goodness, which in turn is uh, understood in practical thoughts, self-understanding um, as uh, seeking the good. Purity of heart. Um, <clears throat> I have a section that's uh, entitled, How the Law Brings Out Evil. <clears throat> as I have acted badly and thus know the good as the law, I want to know that I have acted well. I want to know that I conform to the law and I find it is impossible to know this. I may know that I have conformed to a given description. I can ensure that, but this is nothing, for it is compatible with my having acted badly. It is compatible 
with my being evil. The inevitable result of the effort to know that I am acting well is to find that I do not know this. If I did act well, I would know. It cannot be an accident of my action that it be good. It, it can be good only by springing from knowledge of the good. In this way, my knowledge of the law is itself my knowledge of my being evil. As St. Paul says, the law brings out the sin. If any further sign were needed, this makes it most evident that goodness, thought and practical thought, is no natural goodness. Natural goodness is a principle of life, a life principle. By contrast, the good thought in practical thought is known to be the law, and my knowledge of the law is knowledge of my evil. It is knowledge that I am condemned, and this knowledge is my death. It takes my life out of me, for nothing I can do be, can be anything other than a repetition of my evil. It is no response to say, as Christine Korsgaard says, I must act. As St. Paul says, the law, which was to be my life, has become my death. My knowledge of the law is the same as the knowledge that I am evil, but the law is the good, the good against which I have trespassed. Hence, what I know, knowing that I am evil, is the good. My knowledge that I am evil is my knowledge of the good. However, knowing the good, I am good. Knowing that I am evil, I am good, and know that I am, this appears to be meaningless, but it is not. Now first, observe that there would be no difficulty if we spoke of a natural goodness. The fox that has eaten something bad aches. Its pain, in its pain, is manifest its health. And its pain is in a way a consciousness of the natural badness of its comportment. It's a, it's, a, it's a consciousness of things going against its life form, so things being naturally bad. But that consciousness is itself an expression of its natural goodness, of its life form. So there's no obstacle to an animal's being natural good in its consciousness of natural badness. Right? The pain is itself that in which its goodness is manifest, right? while the pain is at the same time consciousness of natural badness. But that's no problem. It's no problem because, precisely because natural badness is privation, it's limited, it's not on the level of the principle. Now, if per impossibile knowledge of the good were a knowledge of a certain natural goodness, a life form, then this knowledge would be an operation of this very life form and thus would be naturally good unless unfavorable circumstances diverted from its proper course. However, knowledge of the good is thought and as it is thought, its principle is no life form, its principle is illimitable. It is the highest and is the whole. Hence, knowing myself to have acted badly, I am not conscious of a limited diversion, deviation from my principle, that principle remaining unaffected. Rather, I know myself to be evil. My having acted badly shows my rejection of the good. As I know myself to be evil, I know that there is nothing good, no good principle that remains untouched by my being evil and may be expressed in my knowledge that I am evil. And we, and we cannot say, well, I'm evil, but my knowledge of this as where shows as where the intactness of my goodness, precisely in knowing myself to be good, I, I understand that I'm still good. So this is the right thing to say about the fox. But I know myself that, I know of myself that this is untrue because I know that nothing good, no good principle remains untouched by my being evil, for my being evil is, is precisely my having rejected the good. So the contradiction of self-knowledge of evil runs infinitely deeper than the contradiction of sensory consciousness of natural badness, which is the pain of the fox and sensory consciousness of natural badness. Um, Self-knowledge of evil is a deeper contradiction than uh, sensory consciousness of natural badness. If I were to mistake the goodness that I think in practical thought for a certain natural goodness, I would think that my recognition that I, I am evil shows the fundamental integrity of my principle. 
I would take solace in the thought that precisely in the severity of my self-condemnation, I reveal my fundamental goodness as this self-condemnation is itself an act of goodness. Now this line of thought undermines itself and thus takes back my claim to know that I am evil. This assertion is even more complete proof of my thorough corruption. If my knowledge that I'm evil is to be that in which I'm good, then I will not recognize that to be so by limiting the evil that I know myself to be. The evil cannot be less than all of me. It cannot be less than me. Yet, knowing that I am evil, I know the good. I know the good that I know to be illimitable. Uh, for if it were a natural goodness that I know, there would be no need, indeed no possibility, of thinking of my principle to be corrupted. It would make no sense to think of me as rejecting the good. Knowing that I am evil, I know the good to be illimitable, and thus I know the good to have illimitable efficacy. I know the good to be such as to leave no space for an idea of unfavorable circumstances that may impede its actuality. As I know the good to be illimitable, I know that it has the illimitable power to annihilate what opposes it and therefore has always already annihilated it. This is what I know, knowing that I am evil. I know the evil that I am to be overcome and extinguished without residue. But this is what we need to understand. I mean, it's that I'm working out the contradiction in the self-knowledge of evil. See. Now, um, this means now that my knowledge that I'm evil is the same as my knowledge that I am forgiven. I know that I'm evil as I know that I have acted badly. Knowing this, I ask that I be forgiven. She who forgives me declares that I'm not evil. Indeed, she declares that I'm good, fully good. Therewith, she annihilates the evil of my deed, for its evil resided in its springing from a corrupt principle. In forgiving, knowledge of evil is known to be knowledge of the good as what annihilates evil. This is how the good is known to be illimitable. Now, as further consider this scene of forgiveness, where the ultimate and elementary scene of practical thought, <laughs> working out the contradiction within practical thought, the contradiction of good and evil as contained within self-knowledge. Asking for forgiveness, I speak my knowledge that I am evil. This is a, a very different from giving excuses. I mean, I'm, I'm considering a case where I ask for forgiveness. I, it's completely different from Excuse me, well, why, why did this because, well, but, uh, I mean, it, what do you see? I know. I ask for forgiveness, and therein I speak my knowledge that I'm evil. I speak it to someone, to her whom I ask to forgive me. I say to her that there is no excuse for what I have done. I say that it lies with me alone and proves that I'm evil. So asking this, I reject short excursion to Kant, I reject Kant's idea that only God can see the heart. Kant says only God can see the heart. I reject this idea, for I ask her to forgive me, and therein I know that she can see my heart, for I open my heart and let it be seen. And therewith I also reject Kant's notion that only God can judge good and evil. Asking for forgiveness, I know that she whom I ask is my judge. I address her as one who can judge me. I address her as my judge. And this means that I know her to be good, nothing but good, for only goodness can sit in judgment over good and evil. If I thought that only God can see the heart, then nothing she could say would bear on my knowledge that I am evil, for this is knowledge of my rotten heart. So if I thought that only God can judge good and evil, then there would be no point in asking her to forgive me. For if she is not in a position to judge me, then she is not in a position to know 
that I am evil, and if she cannot know this, then nothing she can say touches on my knowledge that I am evil. And if I did not know that she was good, nothing but good, unmixed and unaffectable, then her judgment would be nothing to me. Her judgment would reflect her evil and would not be knowledge. It would be meaningless to ask her for forgiveness. There we see a sign of Kant's heresy. She who forgives does not judge that I have not acted badly. And now we're considering the understanding of the forgiving that she has whom I ask for forgiveness. I first described now the, the, the understanding of her I have in asking her for forgiveness. Now we consider her um, understanding of um, me and of herself uh, in forgiving. She who forgives does not judge that I have not acted badly. On the contrary, if she thought that I have not acted badly, she could not forgive me, for then I would not need to be forgiven. She judges that I have acted badly, yet she judges in the same judgment that I am fully good, unmixed and unaffectable. She asserts that my bad deed has no power to affect the goodness that I am, and thus the evil of my deed is annihilated, for it was evil in being grounded in the evil principle, and the principle is good, she judges, and is so unaffectedly. She who forgives does not think that, even while I acted badly, I am still good in the manner of a natural goodness. She does not assert that there were unfavorable circumstances, considering which she judges that, in spite of my bad deed, my principle is good. Thinking this, she would not only not forgive me, she would treat me as someone to whom the idea of forgiveness does not imply. She could not reject my plea to be forgiven more thoroughly. For I know that she is wrong. I know that my bad deed shows that I am evil. I know that because I know the good to be illimitable. Correlatively, if I took her judgment in this way, I would not understand her to have forgiven me. I would understand her as stating the relevant facts these circumstances. Uh, she would not figure in my thought as an individual I address. She would express an impersonal judgment whose subject is universal. She would just state the facts. You know, this is how it was. There were the circumstances impeding, impeding the proper operation. Like, this is not a relation of individual to individual. Um, if I took her judgment in this way, I would show that I never asked her for forgiveness. Now, she may not forgive me. She may judge that my bad deed chose me to be evil. I cannot know that she will forgive me. However, she too is subject to good and evil and is so in responding to my plea to be forgiven. If she does not forgive me, then judging me to be evil, she considers herself to be good. Only thinking herself good can she think of judging me to be evil. And now this thought of hers is an irrefutable proof of her evil. And being evil, it is not hers to judge good and evil at all. This means that conversely, in forgiving, she is conscious of speaking in her forgiving, her knowledge that she herself is evil. As she forgives me, I know I am forgiven. An absolute certainty in this. I know that my evil is annihilated. If I did not know this, I would reject her forgiveness and thus not only condemn myself, but also condemn her as I judge her to be evil. And this would augment my evil, for being evil, I have no right to judge anyone. Conversely, she, he, she who forgives me knows that my evil is annihilated. If she did not know this and did not know this in forgiving me, then she would not forgive me. Rather, she would condemn me. If there was an open question, you know, is it forgiven, is it gone, is it annihilated, that would show that she did not forgive me, but rather condemns me and thus prove her own evil. In this way, the knowledge of evil sustaining the nexus of forgiving is the same as the recognition of the nothingness of evil and of the illimitable efficacy of the good. The nexus of forgiving relates individual to individual for it is the nexus of the spirit, not the letter. Judging someone according to the letter of the law does not relate to her as an individual. It applies a general description to a particular reality. In this respect, it is like a judgment of natural badness. 
Therefore, a judgment according to the letter does not reach the principle of the evil deed. It does not touch evil. That principle, evil itself, is the individual. There's no general rule in the light of which the rejection of the good can be comprehended. There's no general rule equally that could govern forgiveness. She who forgives does so as an individual. Forgiving is a response of an individual to an individual. In this act, the illimitable good is actual and is known to be actual. It cannot be known from outside this nexus. Hence, this nexus is the actuality of the highest and the whole. Thank you.